We had John closing bell on the heels of uh, that meeting between the president um, and the Chinese on Friday. You had expected this deadline to push back. But a lot of questions about what this deal could be that potentially shapes up and perhaps more importantly, what enforcement could look like. Your thoughts? Well, that, that's the real issue. You know, the, a deal is something that has two aspects. One is what everybody announces and the second is what everybody does afterwards. The announcements here are important and they're going to get done. This is about the trade deal I expected we would uh, do. They'll announce they're going to buy a bunch of stuff, the Chinese guys. They'll announce that uh, we're going to reduce tariffs on both sides. There'll be some IP advantage because IP protection is already underway in China. There's new laws being passed right now. And there's a new enforcement mechanism in China because they need it to protect their own company. So that's working in our favor. The difficult part is industrial policy. The difficult part of enforcement, of course, is governments forcing American companies to exchange technology and so forth. The reason it's so difficult is not because they don't want to do it in Beijing. It's because they have no way of enforcing it through the court system. Courts are very young in China, and this kind of court actually works at the local level in city by city and is influenced by mayors, which is why they had to put penalties in. They go from Beijing out to the mayors and vice mayors to get anything to happen. But all in all, it's a very, very positive thing that's happening this week. John, just to dig into that a little bit more, I mean, we're talking about, or there's a conversation globally happening now around reform of the WTO. How would that play into this deal? Well, WTO has still not quite been lived up to. You know, one of the things we might get announced this week is allowing man uh, more U.S. companies to have majority ownership of things inside China. That's a good thing. That was promised by WTO, and it's been holding out companies like J.P. Morgan and Visa and, and uh, so forth. And uh, there's, you know, that would be a very interesting and easy one to do because UBS has already been approved. And uh, WTO this time around needs to focus more on capital flows and services and less on stuff on boats because the capital flows are what matters. The part of the announcement they're going to do on, uh, on the currency is the least of the enforceable things. They're going to announce they're going to stabilize the RMB against the dollar. That actually is something that Chinese leaders want because they don't want capital to flow out of China and weaken their currency. Stabilizing the currency will help them make their job easier. And Matt, over the weekend, Larry Fink from BlackRock talking to CNBC and, and saying that perhaps one of the more disturbing things about the U.S.-China trade situation right now is that you got China buying, what, a trillion dollars plus worth of U.S. treasuries because of the trade deficit and the impact that could have longer term over the coming years on U.S. debt, on the Treasury market, and just at a time when our deficit is expanding. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the question uh, ultimately is who, who is going to end up buying the U.S. Treasury bonds? And one of the things that Larry Fink didn't mention is who bought all of the Treasury bonds in 2018. It certainly wasn't China. In fact, it was mostly U.S. households that were the biggest buyers of U.S. Treasuries through 2018. So, you know, from my perspective, ultimately somebody has to buy the debt. The question is who's going to buy it. If it's not going to be China, uh, then it's probably going to be somebody in the United States. And what we saw in 2018 was that two and a half, three percent 10 year Treasury yields was enough to incentivize U.S. households to come in and scoop up most of the debt that was issued in 2018. Matt, if we get a deal between the U.S. and China this year, we've got a Fed that has become more dovish, that it's in, in this wait and see patient mode. How does that shape Fed policy moving forward? I mean, it's, it's a great question, and particularly at this time of, of the year when we're going into the Fed's review of its policy strategies and tools in June, um, there's a lot of focus on exactly how policy is going to move forward, especially given that inflation has been relatively subdued uh, and, and hasn't really achieved the Fed's 2% target for any length of time worth talking about. So. Uh, when I think about the future of Fed policy, uh, it's, it's probably not going to be higher rates for, for some time to come. Um, you, you may get another couple of rate hikes this year if inflation does begin to march higher. But again, the Fed's talking about reviewing its inflation goal uh, at this point, how, how to characterize that inflation goal. It, it's unlikely that they're going to be overly aggressive at hiking rates when, when inflation is still below their 2% target at this point. 